Welcome to Jones and to Go. I'm Brian, and today we're going to talk about our RV refrigerator. But I'm going to give you some information that you're probably not going to get from your dealer. So stick around. You just might find this pretty interesting. Okay, before we get into this, a couple of things. First, this video might run a little bit longer than what I like, and I apologize for that, but there's a lot of information to share with you. And second, I want to make it very clear that this issue that I'm going to talk about today with this refrigerator has absolutely nothing to do with the manufacturer of your RV. For instance, we own a Montana by Keystone, Keystone or Montana did absolutely nothing wrong in the installation of this refrigerator. And I'm not saying that just because we've become ambassadors for Keystone uh, Montana. This holds true for any manufacturer of any RV manufacturer, whatever your RV manufacturer is. So many times I will see somebody post something on social media in one of these RV forums um, about a problem they're having will say maybe their refrigerator or maybe their stove or their air conditioner and right away somebody chimes in and blames the RV manufacturer. That's not the case. The RV manufacturer has nothing to do with the design or functionality of this refrigerator any more than they do your stove that they put in or the brand of air conditioner. That all falls on you know, say Norcold or Dormetic or whatever brand appliance that you have. So I just wanted to clear that up. Um, this has nothing to do with the manufacturer. So let's get into this. Okay, I think the best way to go ahead and start this out is just kind of tell you our story and the experience that we've had thus far with this refrigerator. Um, we have a 2020 Montana. Um, and we chose to go with, when we purchased this, the RV refrigerator for two reasons. Number one, the way we travel. A lot of times we could be on the road for a day and a half, two days at a time. So we figured the RV refrigerator is the way to go. We can run it on gas. Um, things will stay cold. The second reason we chose an RV refrigerator over the residential was because of the park that we were in at the time down in Florida. We would come back and forth from Florida, Ohio throughout the winter, and it seemed like almost every time that we got back to Florida, the microwave was flashing, which meant one thing, the power had gone out. So that was another reason that we were leaning heavily towards an RV refrigerator. And hopefully when, if you are um, in that situation right now where you're trying to decide in your new RV, whether you want the residential or you want the RV, Hopefully the information that I give you today is going to help make that decision for you because like I said in the intro I'm going to give you information that your dealer probably is not going to give you So let's start out with our first issue that we had and I read this on forums all the time and I'm not going to go through the whole fix for this issue with you because several other people have done videos on just that so that tells me that this problem has been going on and is very common with this refrigerator. Now, a lot of things today I'm going to talk about specifically relate to this Norcold 2118 SST. You may have a Dometic product in your RV, and some of these things may apply to you as well. I'm not sure. So the first issue was, and hopefully you guys can see it, um, you have, if you open up your refrigerator, the left hand door has this flapper which opens and then when you close the refrigerator it's supposed to close. The problem is it sticks and it stays only halfway closed which means you have an air leak in your door. So there's an easy fix for that and I'm going to show you that real quick. Now I'm not going to go through the whole um, repair because our refrigerator is running, we have stuff in it and I just don't want it to warm up real fast. So the easy fix is this. This door actually sits on a pin on the bottom. And then the hinge on the top is screwed in at the top to hold it to the refrigerator. 
So the easy way to get to that is just pop this off. You can use a butter knife, flathead screwdriver, whatever you want. And there's three screws in here, three bolts. Take those off, the whole door will fold out. Pick it up off the hinge on the bottom and you add a washer or two to bring this door up to where it belongs so that that flapper is not rubbing on the bottom of the refrigerator and getting caught anymore. So that was, that was issue number one that we had. And so how we realized that was a problem was one day I opened up the refrigerator to get a glass of milk. Nothing in the refrigerator, even the cans of soda felt cold. So what's the first thing that I do? Get online and start looking in forums and seeing if anybody else has had a problem. The first issue that came up and the most hits that came up on that was check your flapper. Sure enough, ours was stuck. So I got that fixed with the washer. Everything was fine, it seemed like. But when we had that issue, right away we thought, maybe we better put a thermometer in that refrigerator because once you get to 40 degrees and above, things start growing bacteria and it's just not safe. So we went to Walmart, got a thermometer, got it in there, started monitoring the temperature in this refrigerator. Probably the best we could do was like right around that 40 degree mark, even if we cranked it to nine. So we started kind of worrying about it from there. The freezer as well, another one of the number one complaints I hear from other RV owners is they can't keep ice cream in it. Um, it won't freeze ice cream hard. I agree with that. Um, before we made our last repair on this, the best that we could do with ice cream, if we positioned it in the lower left corner of the freezer like everybody recommended was maybe soft serve at best, but most of the time we'd go to the store, we'd get ice cream, we have a bowl of ice cream, the next time we go for ice cream, you might as well bring a straw because you've got a milkshake. So that was the other biggest complaint with these refrigerators. So the third complaint we had was this. The first year that we spent in Florida with this Montana um, were those two issues, but then we found another issue when it was time to come home. And I'll back up a little bit. The three years before that, we had another Keystone product. It was a Cougar, but it only had the eight or 10 cubic foot Dometic refrigerator in it. Um, and so we would come and go they wouldn't charge us for our electric monthly. They would just let us pay it at the end of the three months when we left. And for a three month period, we would range anywhere from 45 to $65 for an electric bill. So the first year with the Montana, when we went to pay our electric bill before we left, we got a shock. It was $274. And right away we thought, well, there must be something wrong with their meter until we got home. We have a dedicated pad that we park our RV on and it has a 30 amp pedestal to keep things plugged in because we like to go on a moment's notice so it's rare for us to unload the refrigerator. The first month after being home from Florida, our electric bill went up $100. So we started doing some troubleshooting because the only reason for our bill at home to jump like that was because we plugged the RV in. So. We plugged, I bought a meter, we put it in on the pedestal. We were averaging anywhere from about 14 to 16 kilowatt hours of electricity a day in a 24 hour period. Our whole house doesn't use that. So in the process of trying to isolate what was pulling all that electricity, we plugged the meter directly into the refrigerator. Bingo, that's where it was at. First thing we did was call Norcold said, hey, something's wrong here. Number one, we're using $100 a month in electricity for this thing. I was really disappointed in their response. The guy right away was, well, you know, it is a bigger refrigerator. It's gonna use more electricity. And of course, my reaction was $100 a month, really? So the second issue we were having, we really couldn't, no matter if we put it on five or nine, this refrigerator struggled to get below 40 degrees. So to make a long story short, there's gonna be a long way to get it into a dealer. A mobile RV repair came out. They said, oh, we tested the heating elements. One of them's bad. That's why it's using so much electricity and working so hard, because one of them's trying to keep up. So they replaced that, nothing changed. 
Then it started throwing some error codes. So Norcold finally, after back and forth quite a bit, decided, okay, we're going to authorize a new cooling unit. So we have to find some place, somebody to put a cooling unit in. We ended up out at Affinity RV Group in Goshen, Indiana. They did a wonderful job. So I'll give them a plug. Um, if you need an RV repair, it's warranty work, whatever. If, if you're anywhere near Goshen, Indiana, or within a few hours, Affinity RV Group did a great job. So they replaced the cooling unit. Once we got the RV back, um, we continued to monitor the temperature. We would set it at about five to seven, and we were getting below 40 again, but we never really did get past like 34, which I guess is okay for a refrigerator because they say 34 to 36 degrees is about normal. Freezer, no improvement with that at all. Still can't keep ice cream. But we really didn't notice, and maybe we didn't pay enough attention, I don't know, a huge increase in our electric at home. But I don't know if that was because we come and go so much in the summertime. So we'll fast forward back to Florida, second year with the Montana in Florida. We're in a new park, very well maintained park. So we get to Florida and um, the first light bill was only for 10 days, $48. So right away I'm thinking, I don't think we're fixed. We watched the temperatures in the refrigerator. They would bounce. Nothing was ever consistent. It never held any temperatures consistently. We'd go from 33 to 41 degrees. Um, we could leave the coach for the day to go to the beach or whatever. I would look at the thermometer. We might be like 33 in the fridge and like 10 in the freezer. We'd come home and we'd be 42 in the fridge and 21 degrees in the freezer. I'd look, refrigerator's not running. I turn it off, turn it back on, and it wouldn't get back down to acceptable temperatures until the next morning. So we continued to monitor that. The second month, our light bill for a full 30 days, $78. So to try not to drag this out too long with this issue, we knew we still have an issue. Um, it seemed like if the refrigerator set, if the RV sat for a week, um, we'd have that problem where it would just quit cooling for a while and we'd have to shut it down for a little bit and start it back up again. So now we're thinking we still have a problem. And sure enough, it went on through the whole winter. Um, and I'm going to go through in a little bit later and compare numbers um, as far as all of our light bills from before this recent fix to now. And you guys are going to see what a huge difference it made. So we knew we still had a problem. We were tired of dealing with it. So we called a company over in Shipshawana, Indiana, JC Refrigeration, after we had first started having trouble with our refrigerator, started doing a lot of research. And we decided that we were gonna take it in and let them put in one of their custom built cooling units because you know, $270 for three months for a light bill is, for an RV, is ridiculous. And it wasn't consistent. We couldn't rely on it anymore. We went over April 15th to Shipshawana, Indiana, and we put in a new cooling unit. So we're going to take you over there with us now and show you some of that process. And I'm going to come back in and forth, back and forth and kind of explain some things to you. So let's go to Ship Shawana and we're going to show you what we did and we're going to explain to you some of the options they gave us and what we decided to go with and why. So let's go. Okay, I'm going to pop in here real quick before we really get into showing you um, the process of installing this new cooling unit here. 
um, what some of the options that we had from JC Refrigeration were. So option number one was we could keep our refrigerator as a traditional RV refrigerator that runs on LP gas or electricity. Um, the difference in their cooling unit is this under that option is they have a bigger cooling unit. Uh, and that being said, it also uses less electricity and less BTUs if you're running it on gas. And that's something that I didn't mention earlier. We did try running ours on LP because of recommendations. And, and I agree with all the guys that say that they do run better on LP. They do run a little bit better as far as temperatures and things like that. But what we found was this. We were going through a 30 pound LP bottle a week. And when we're in Florida, it costs us $25 to fill that LP bottle. So if you do the math, that's still $100 a month if we're running it on LP. So we didn't gain anything. Um, and it still, it didn't run that much better. So that was one option that they gave us to keep it there. And we would definitely run more efficiently and it would run cooler because of the larger cooling unit. Option number two was to go with a compressor style cooling unit that runs on 120 volts. So essentially that would be converting this RV refrigerator as it sits to a residential refrigerator. So if you have a coach that yours is failing and you've thought about going to a residential refrigerator, maybe because you already know how expensive these are to run, you don't have to do that. It, you know, if you think about it, if you have a refrigerator this size and you want to put a residential, you're going to spend $2,000, $2,500 um, to go out and buy a new residential refrigerator this size, which would be probably 20 cubic feet. Um, and you can do it for half that cost if you let JC Refrigeration just replace your cooling unit. So if that's a thought that you have, there's an option for you. Um, that wasn't the route that I chose to go. The third option was a compressor style um, cooling unit that runs on 12 volt. And that seemed more appropriate for us because of the way we travel. And, you know, if the power goes out somewhere, we're still going to run on our batteries for quite a while because the 12 volt compressor only draws like five amps. Um, once we got here uh, to ship Shawana, they gave us a fourth option, which was a dual 12 volt compressor. And here's why they developed the dual 12 volt compressor, because they found over time the folks that were going out to like Arizona, <clears throat> excuse me, and the warmer climates that got above 100 degrees, the single compressor was kind of struggling a little bit to keep up. So they came up with this dual compressor. Now, one question you might be asking yourself is, why not just put a bigger compressor in? And that's the same question that my neighbor asked me. And the reason is simple. There's only so much room between the back of this refrigerator and the outside wall of your coach. So they had to come up with something that would fit in there, and that fits in. And the reason that we chose to go that route was for two reasons. Um, I like the fact that now I can control the temperature of my freezer separate than the refrigerator. And we just don't know. Um, eventually, we're going to go full time, so we don't know where we're going to end up. And we may end up in some of them 110, 150 degree days out in Arizona or wherever. So we might as well just be prepared for anything. So that's the route we went. And we're gonna go back out in the plant now and show you some more of this installation process. And I'll check back within you later. And like I said, at the end, I'm gonna give you guys some numbers and some comparisons. And so if you're thinking about uh, one of these conversions, it might help you make up your mind which conversion is best for you. So let's go back out in the plant. So our appointment this morning was at 8.30 and they pulled us into the bay here right at 8.30 this morning. And it is only nine o'clock now. You can see they've got this thing completely tore out, the old unit tore out, and now they're prepping everything to put the new unit in. So probably with them, shop's pretty busy here, so sorry about that. Probably within two or three hours, we're gonna be out of here with a brand new refrigerator. I'm gonna 
give you a look at this old unit laying on the floor here, which we are so glad to get rid of. Okay, let's see if we can wrap this up before this becomes an hour-long video. Number one, I want to thank JR and his staff over at JC Refrigeration for being so accommodating, uh, for getting us in and getting us out so quickly. As you saw, our appointment was at 8.30 in the morning. They got us right in at 8.30 in the morning. And at 11 o'clock, this thing was up and running. And as you can see in the video, they took a lot of care to cover everything up and make sure everything was cleaned up when they were done. So that made Tina happy. Um, I will say this, I know you guys are waiting for some numbers. So let's start out with um, once we got finished at JC Refrigeration. Uh, typically before this conversion, um, we could fire up our refrigerator. It would take a good 24 hours before it was cool enough in that refrigerator to even put food in it. Um, we stayed the weekend out in Shipshawana just in case there was some issues. We could be close to JC Refrigeration. There were no issues. I will say this. We left there just before noon. Our campground was just a couple miles down the road where we stayed. We backed the, the rig in, got it set up, and then we went and had some lunch. And when we came back, this thing was cooled down to 34 degrees and we were putting food in it. So with just within a couple of hours, we were putting food back in it. So now, what you guys have been waiting for, let's talk about numbers. Um, I've already told you the kind of electricity that the refrigerator was using before this conversion. So let's talk about what it's using now. When we took our averages while we were in Florida, and we typically had between 50s and low 80s for our temperatures in Florida the whole winter, and we averaged, I took the bills and I averaged, we were averaging 17 kilowatt hours a day for this rig. And after the first month, when we got a $48 bill for just 10 days, we decided we're not gonna run the heat pump the next month, we're not gonna run the fireplace, and we're gonna run the hot water tank on propane just to see if it was still the refrigerator sucking up all that electricity. Sure enough, that's what was sucking it up. Now, with the dual compressor, 12 volt compressor, it does use a little bit more. I think it's drawn like seven or seven and a half amps. Um, I put a meter, we plugged it in here at home. I put the meter on the pole. And before we were, like I said, we were averaging 17 kilowatt hours per day in Florida. We're using like two and a half a day now here. So we're basically taking our electric consumption down to almost nothing for this refrigerator now. It cools down fast. Like I said, with the dual compressor, we can control our freezer and our 
refrigerator temperature separately now. Um, here's another thing that I didn't mention before. One of the, I want to say cons, if we're going to talk about pros and cons about an RV, RV refrigerator, when we fired this thing back up back in December to load it up so we could head for Florida, it was cool here. And in the cool days, this didn't work well at all. I couldn't get the freezer down below, I think, 24 degrees. And the refrigerator stayed in the high 40s. It just wouldn't run right. And I have seen people, especially with that cold snap they had in Texas over the winter this, this past winter, um, people complaining about their ref RV refrigerators just flat out quit. I've had other people say theirs works just fine in cold weather. Ours did not. And we saw that even when we were in Florida. Um, if we dropped into the 40s at night, we'd get up in the morning and it would be, the refrigerator would be back up in the 40s and the freezer would be back up in the 20s. It just didn't work well. Now, I don't know if all this timing is just for the, <laughs> Mother Nature is cooperating with me because I'm doing this uh, video on this refrigerator. Since we've had this compressor installed, we did have a couple of cold nights. I did not see any inconsistencies in the temperatures in this refrigerator or freezer when it got cold. It got down into the 20s last night. I came in, checked the thermometer. The freezer was at one degree and the refrigerator was at 34 degrees. And that's where it was the night before it started getting cold. So it stayed consistent regardless of what the temperature was outside. I will say this, we were cranking this thing up to nine just to try to keep it cool enough when it was the original cooling unit from Norcold. And we are still gonna have to find that sweet spot now with this compressor. We started out at seven when we left JC Refrigeration and it was freezing the jugs of water almost solid in there. So we started backing it down. Right now it's a little cool here in Ohio. I've got it turned all the way down to one and I'm still maintaining 34 degrees in the, well actually I did get it to 35 degrees today in the refrigerator and the freezer is staying at like one degree or zero degrees. So I couldn't be happier with that. I know that as it warms up this summer, we're gonna play with it a little bit. I really don't anticipate bumping it up more than three um, and keeping up with the warm weather. So. For those of you who are still on the fence as far as whether you want a residential refrigerator or an RV refrigerator, um, I guess the pros of an RV refrigerator are you have dual cooling um, capabilities there with propane or electricity. So if you're going down the road, um, that's the reason we chose the 12 volt is so that we can still go down the road. My truck is a, is a F-350 I diesel, so I have two alternators and two batteries. It does not have any issues keeping up with keeping the batteries on this rig charged going down the road. So having the 12 volt system now, I feel a little safer that I don't have a flame going back here when we're going down the road. And I know that's one of the leading causes of fires in RVs is these RV refrigerators with the ammonia and things like that. So now I feel a little better. I'm using hardly any any energy to run it. I'm safer going down the road. It cools down faster. It's consistent. It stays consistent with temperature swings, uh, warm and cold. So there's a lot of pros to this 12 volt system. Um, we are going back. I wanna say one more thing about JC Refrigeration. They also do solar systems. So we are going back and I think we're going to start out with 600 watts of solar on the roof and that should pretty much cover us no matter what happens, our refrigerator is still going to run. So I hope you guys found what we included for information in this video helpful. If you are interested in having your refrigerator converted, we're going to put all of the information for JC Refrigeration in the link below. If you guys have any comments, any questions, please leave them. Um, we'd love to hear your comments about this conversion, what you think of it. So far, we're extremely happy with it. Um, it's been a week that we've been monitoring the energy usage. And like I said, we're at like two and a half kilowatt hours per day. 
and that's really just kind of running the converter because the refrigerator is drawing all its power directly from the batteries. So that's basically just keeping the batteries up. And once we go solar, I'm sure we're going to use less energy than that. So again, guys, if you like the video, please give us a thumbs up and leave some comments and let us know what you think about this. And if you haven't subscribed yet, please do so and, and hit the bell. Uh, we have a couple more modifications to make to our Montana and I'll probably video those as well. So we'll see you guys on the next video. Thanks for watching.